right now, when we're talking about safety in a really unsafe time, when we don't feel safe ourselves because our neuroception is constantly being pulled for danger and threat, is all of us as mental health people have significant and I think valid concerns about the mental health implications of this time. And there is something we can do that is so simple that I think is so powerful, and that is this, to be thinking about our messaging. So with our kids, when we say things like, we're not going to the playground or you can't go to school or, you know, you can't see your friends because it's not safe. It's dangerous to do that. People can get sick. And we use threat-based, danger-based messaging. And we do that repeatedly. We know that the brain is making these neural associations. And my fear is that we are creating neuroception of danger around things like going to school, being with friends. So what we want to do with this idea of creating safety and our children relying on us as being safe harbors and safe havens from the storm is to focus all of our messaging from a safety-based place. Therapist Uncensored brings you decades of experience with interpersonal psychotherapy, relational neuroscience, modern attachment, and anything else they think will be helpful in healing humans. Now, here are your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Hi, everyone. This is Ann, and we are doing replays of some of our most important episodes and timely episodes throughout our five seasons. Today's episode was originally recorded in May of 2020 during one of the most intense times of the coronavirus lockdown. And in this episode, my co-host Sue Marriott talks with doctors Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson about strategies for showing up for yourself and your children, especially while under significant stress. Now, given the recent rise again across the world in cases from the variant, and the increase in fear and restrictions, we decided that this episode was extremely relevant today. So Dan and Tina, as well as Sue, are all experts in attachment and interpersonal neurobiology. And together they discuss ways to help us all engage in our more secure part of our attachment system. So remember, we all have secure ways of relating. Some of us live there more, some of us based on our history, you have more preoccupied or dismissing or disorganized ways of living more than we want. But we all have secure ways of connecting to our attachment system. But when we are full of fear, distress, chronic threat and stress, we can shut that completely down in ways that hurt us all. Now, this episode really brings home ways we can focus our attention to boost our secure attachment system and engage our children as well as other loved ones through the power of showing up from our more secure centers. So I think you guys will get a lot out of this episode. Let's jump in. Well, welcome back, Dan and Tina. I can't tell you how excited we are to have you back and to have you guys together is just such a delight. Well, we're delighted to be here with you, Sue. (laughs) Great to see you, Tina. And it's always, you two are some of my just favorite people. So I've been Aww. looking forward to this. I, I told Sue in an email that I wish I had looked a few days back in my calendar about today because I would have had so much joy just anticipating this conversation. That is so sweet. You are always so warm. I want to take notes about how to be warm. So because uh, <laughs> I'm working on that. <laughs> so beautifully, Sue. So I'm going to learn from you. And Dan, just always want to take the opportunity to just on the behalf of so many therapists, the developing mind changed how we practice. And uh, again, it was the birth of Austin and Connection that came together and brought everybody from Bonnie and Stan and, you know, Luke Cozzolino and Sarah Payton, all of these people together. The effect of it has just been such an incredible ripple effect to, and it's gotten into the psychoanalytic communities, to the group communities. So there's really been this integration of the material So that has just been literally life-changing for many of us therapists, but then all the people that we see. Well, thank you, Sue. And I, you know, the third edition of The Developing Mind will be coming out just in a couple of weeks. So it's gratifying just to hear that it 
it was worth all the effort to, to put that book together. And the field has grown so much. So it's, it's wonderful here. It's useful. Oh, understatement. It's just totally, really, really fantastic. It's, it's sort of our Bible. It's the Bible. Yeah. Yes. So our listeners, if you all are new, kind of tuning in, Dan Siegel is would be considered the father, certainly, of interpersonal neurobiology and really applying, seeing the mind as not just existing in the skull. And now, if people already have your older edition, is there, do we update? Do we buy the next one? What would you, you recommend? Know, as a textbook, it's more expensive than your everyday book. So I'm not urging people to go broke buying it because it is a textbook. So it's used in graduate school and college and stuff like that. Yeah. However, if you say, is there new stuff in the third edition over the second and first edition? Absolutely. This edition is kind of amazing because being the age I am now and the field being over 20 years old, you know, I decided to put stuff in there that is pretty personal in terms of you as a reader. So it really asks you as a reader to go on a kind of journey deeply into your mind that I didn't feel comfortable doing in the first two editions. I did in other books, but not in that book. And then it takes you on a pretty deep exploration of the nature of not only mind, but consciousness itself. And so it explores things like what's the science of presence? And what does it really mean to be present from a view of the mind as being broader than the brain and bigger than the body? So it's a pretty wild, but scientifically grounded view that I don't know how people are gonna take it. So we'll see when it comes out. But I'm very thrilled that I had 18 interns work with me to actually challenge the fundamental principles of interpersonal neurobiology. And I asked them to prove even with one paper that they're wrong. So a lot of what Tina and I write is based on, you know, the synthesis of the science. And then we make it sort of practical for parents. But what's cool about it from a science point of view is that, you know, I've been able to have these science students really dive through the world's literature, trying to prove these ideas are wrong. And then what they do is ultimately they find that actually they can't find anything that shows it's wrong, but they can find a ton of things to support it. So the principles like the Tina and I write about, about integration and about the centrality of relationships and being present, our last book, you know, is just a thrill to write that with you, Tina, because we have the fun of saying, okay, the science work is done by the researchers, then the science synthesis can be done, you know, through the Mindsight Institute. And then Tina and I have the fun to say, okay, now what is really useful about that for a parent to know and how can we express it in a way that they and their children and adolescents can actually benefit from it? You know, really being able to bring the principles out and have them digestible, understandable. Again, that's what we're about on the podcast for sure is to really try to bring the relational sciences outside of the choir and really help people understand and evaluate. So any student or therapist that doesn't yet have the developing mind, you'll see on our resource list as, as our new website comes up, it is one of the top few recommended books for your library. So we really encourage you to do that. Which brings us though to, as far as bringing that thick text, really complex material into something that our listeners right now can sink their teeth into, Tina Payne Bryson and Dan Siegel have their new book, The Power of Showing Up, and around presence. It's called How Parental Presence Shapes Our Kids and How Their Brains Get Wired. And so when we think about the presence, here we are all in quarantine. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of physical presence. And I was thinking maybe we could have the umbrella of this stress that every family is under right now as we elucidate some of the ideas of your book. Because the book is really based on 50 years of cross-cultural research about one of the best predictors for how well kids turn out being that secure attachment piece, you know, the purpose of secure attachment and the purpose of the attachment system in the first place is to help us survive, particularly during moments of threat, danger, and distress. So, you know, when this book came out, you know, and when Dan and I were writing it, we had no idea there was a global pandemic around the corner. But the book in many ways is even more more relevant when we are in times of threat and distress and danger. And that's when we most need to show up for each other and for our kids. And so I think that the stress that we're all really facing right now, we know there's a lot of unknowns, but there are a lot of things we know about what we need most, particularly in times like this. And that is to show up. 
And by showing up, can you say a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, you know, it's a simple thing. And I just, first of all, I just want to express gratitude to Tina because on this journey of writing parenting books, it's just been a joy to write them with you, Tina. So I'm just filled with that feeling of just joy about connection. And the thing about showing up, just to give you the broad view, is that Tina and I are always trying to think, like, what's a way to be absolutely true to the science, but make it in such a fashion that it's, you can feel it in your body, you know, that you can make it really practical, memorable. So we'll have dinner, the two of us with our spouses, Scott Bryson and Caroline Welch, and the four of us will get together and, you know, we usually are thinking kind of idealistic things, Tina and I, and then, and then Scott and Caroline kind of are the strings that pull our, our balloons that are floating around and the abs are down and we say, okay, okay, so this will be it. So showing up means how do you bring your full awareness to be present, basically, to be connecting both with your child, in the case of parenting, but also with your own internal world. So you're not distracted by your smartphone or your computer or things on your mind. Of course, you can get distracted, but then you make a repair to those ruptures. And showing up doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means you're present. And this idea then became the central feature for this book. Each of our four books has, you know, a central message that it starts with and then builds the framework around it. In this one, it's like, okay, Could parents learn the science of showing up? How do you show up? How does showing up show up? You know, (laughs) to use it in two slightly different ways. You know, what's the appearance of being present? And how does it look from the outside? How does it feel from the inside? So broadly speaking, it's a receptive awareness that you bring to your interactions with your children. That's what parental presence means and that's what showing up as a parent involves. Tina I think was- there'll be a lot, a lot of disappointed people that feel like, hey, I'm here. Isn't that enough? You know? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait. Um, yeah, I was just on my smartphone. I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. I could be physically here and you could be completely not there. That's right. <laughs> That was beautiful. I just would also thank Dan. It's such an honor to write with you, my friend, and to do this meaningful work with our friendship and our families being connected. And so thank you for that beautiful comment. And I'm so grateful and appreciative to you as well. But I don't have anything to add to that. I think Dan said that beautifully. Well, and going back to what you said earlier, Tina, about that we are under threat and that that's what the attachment system is about. We don't really need it when all things are going well as far as it being active. But Sue, so if I could just build on what you just said, because sure. Tina's comment about that, I think is so powerful because the people listening may you know, want to know a little bit about the science of, of this stuff. But when you look at the research on something called attention, which in interpersonal neurobiology we define as that process which directs the flow of energy and information. It has directionality to it, right? Attention does not have to be an awareness. Attention, which is streaming energy information through your information processing system, basically, which can include your brain, include your body, and it can even include relationships because the mind is not just inside your head. So philosophers would, or even cognitive scientists would say cognition is extended and it's embedded. It's not just embodied and enacted. So these are called the four E's of cognition. The point here is that attention can be with awareness. So you say, oh, I'm really worried about the pandemic. So I'm distracted. Okay, you got that. We got that. But that's focal attention, attention and awareness. Non-focal attention, which is actually where the majority of attention is, that is what's pulling your energy and information flow resources is usually non-focal, which means attention that's not involving awareness. So what Tina is saying is so powerful because just to put the science foundation beneath it, that you can say, oh, in my awareness, I'm just thinking how happy I am and how everything is fine and it's all going well and blah, blah, blah. And I'm trying not to listen to the news and I know people are suffering and losing their lives and livelihoods, but I can't think about that so much. I'm going to just distract myself. And then, and this is true for me, you know, I can't get things done. I'm exhausted. I try to do some, you know, intellectual things I'm trying to do 
and I'm completely depleted of the energy to do that. And I go, what's going on? Well, it's because of exactly what Tina is pointing out, is that my neuroception, Steve Porges' term for our checker that's always checking for danger, is pulling non-focal attention to the environment. That is, I've got to be wary for things that could kill me or my loved ones. And that little virus is invisible. So it's like every horror story writer's dream to have this invisible thing that will get in you and make it so you can't breathe. And so your non-focal attention is being drained with issues of life and death. Even if your conscious mind is saying, hey, I'm fine, everything's okay, what's the problem? Because this is what a pandemic is doing to us. I don't know if anyone else experienced that, but I certainly find myself really good at cleaning the house and seeing dirty things and cleaning them up because that's like focal attention on something I can master and have a sense of potency about rather than the feeling of helplessness that you can feel, you know, in the face of the pandemic. What you just said there is so powerful, Dan. And I think one of the things that I've been so aware of in terms of my focal attention and I know you're having this experience as well, is that, you know, as people that are often looked to as people who help promote mental health and know about child development, we're getting so many requests for how do we fix this? How do we mitigate the damage? The truth is that a lot of the time I have ideas about certain things, but a lot of the time I just say, how the hell am I supposed to know what the answer is? I don't know. And so there's this weight of, of helplessness of feeling like I am called to help, but feeling like I don't know how to do that in effective ways while also feeling overwhelmed by too much information that's coming out there. And so when I become aware of that from my IPNB core and my lens, then I go, okay, what I want to do now is curiously attend to my own neuroception and to start actually rediscovering myself. We have to rediscover ourselves in an experimental, curious way to tend to our own neuroception. Like, I'll give a couple examples. Typically, when I'm traveling and I'm working and the work is never done and I'm a really present mom most of the time, when I go and walk the dog, I typically don't listen to anything because my world is so overstimulating and just being without any stimulation is really regulating for me. What I've noticed since this has happened is that when I'm out walking, I'm actually have been listening to Bruce Perry's book, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, which, you know, is obviously all about trauma and it's a, it's a heavy book. But when I'm walking and I'm listening to it, I am delighted. It feels so good to me to be listening to something interesting where I'm just by myself. So it's like I'm having to learn sort of new things that delight me and create a sense of stillness within me. And then other things that are dysregulating. One of the other things I know about myself is that I feel safe when I have information. So I'm a person who... The more information I have, the safer and more predictable things feel to me. But I've also noticed that swimming in the media and watching a lot of news makes me feel my neuroception for danger gets activated. So then I go, okay, let me try an experiment. Let me curiously, I tend to that. I'm noticing I don't feel safe when I'm watching this. I don't feel good in my body. So I'm going to set the recorder to record 30 minutes of world news, and I'm going to watch that at the end of the day. So I get some information, but I'm not swimming in it. So it's really about curiously attending and exploring and relearning ourselves in a new place. That is incredible and beautiful and totally can relate to so many of those examples. It's really been a time I've noticed of redefining, you know, that we can go on automation about what we should do for work and what you know, our routines are and things like that. And all of that has been thrown out. And so we've really been able to more from a bottom up perspective, relook at our routines and our habits. And that can be really dysregulated, (laughs) or it can be a way of finding some calm and some peace and some presence, I think. Absolutely. I mean, you know, before we dive into the specifics of the showing up book, I'll just say that building what you're saying, Sue, and Tina, what you powerfully, you know, gave us this example of is, People were calling the Institute or the Mindside Institute and saying, you know, can you do something to help us in the pandemic? And, you know, there's so many things going on with meditation and this and that. What we are is like a a brick and mortar center for interpersonal neurobiology, you know, for synthesizing all the sciences, one framework. 
So we sent out an email that just said, if you want to have a space to talk about like the personal experience of this planetary pandemic, maybe that'll pep us all up, you know, and I'm an acronym addict. So that was the acronym, personal experience, planetary pandemic. So I thought it would be really fun to have like a couple dozen people have a conversation about what is the personal experience. So we have this thing where, you know, you come as an individual, which is a me, but you realize we're all interconnected with each other and with nature. That's a we. So me plus we, the integrated view would be we, right? M-W-E, we. So it's a pep we up community. So so we throw throughout this email, and now we're about a month into it. We have 12,000 people coming for this weekly meeting, and we set up this back platform for people to have conversations. So all these groups are self-organizing basically around the following theme. Okay, here's what's happening now with the pandemic, you know, so we want to do our personal experience. But how do we now, this is how the, the acronym has transformed just in a month, to personal exploration of planetary possibility. So how do we see the disruption that has happened in our human family during this horrible pandemic moment as actually an opportunity to allow a system that may not have been so good that it's destroying Earth with huge amount of environmental injustice and social injustice. And when you can see people who are marginalized are devastated even more by the virus. So how do we actually take this moment of disruption, this period of disorganization is actually how a system can reorganize in a different way so we don't go back to business as usual. And we use this to think deeply about what will be a skillful way to nudge cultural evolution in a positive direction. So that's what the conversation this we community is, that perhaps the isolated solo self of the pre-pandemic era that was probably going on for thousands of years in contemporary culture can now be transformed to an integrated identity. And it's really been given a lot of us in that community this experience of, instead of being hopeless, feeling like we can be of help, that we can be of service. And we talk about five S's where we look for synergy, you know, how things all kind of fit together in an integrated way. They're different, but they link the subjective experience, you know, of how you can own what you're going through and not have to be one way or the other. Science, so we want to look at the rigorous discipline study of reality that challenges itself. And even spirituality, which is like living a life of meaning and connection. And then the fifth S of these S's is being of service. We try to build a community where science is at the center of it, but it involves these other S's too, so that we can see how can we be of service to Earth. Which is, would be a great way, if we can find a way to help and to be useful for many of us, that would also be a really a way to self-regulate. In other words, moving from this passivity and this helplessness to action. Um, yeah. Yeah, I really love that. about polyvagal theory and about the idea of mobilization versus immobilized state right. and how that makes a huge difference in how we process trauma in our bodies and our minds and our relationships. So that mobilization that you have really been at the forefront of, Dan, is just stunning. Well done kind of looking for leadership and looking for direction. This might be a stretch, but when you were describing Tina walking and listening to that book as actually being regulating instead of overstimulating, like my fantasy was it's like he's such a strong leader and, you yeah. know, decisive. And so that could give it holding and like a feeling of holding, like somebody knows something that I can just rest and let him take care of this thinking and receive something. And I, I feel like that's a real hunger in general of like if we could just – have a dad, have a mom, you know. So you mentioned the S's. So let's talk about the S's in this book because yes. protection is so much part of it. And also, by the way, listeners, as they're talking, even though the book is directed to parents and talking about creating and developing secure kids, fostering, promoting secure kids, this is totally relevant for any of you in my category that I'm proud of, which is working very hard earning security. I never say it in past tense. (laughs) And there's many of you out there that are doing that. And we're interested in how to rewire our own narratives, our own unconscious schemas. And I think that this information is really applicable both to adults and to parents working with kids. 
I think really, regardless of if you're a parent or not, remembering that our attachment needs are throughout our lifespan and that really these four qualities that we're going to talk about in a minute, these four S's, which are different S's than the ones that Dan had before, Mm -hmm. these are really qualities or things to cultivate in all of our relationships. They're needs we have in all of our relationships. So really when we talk about how do we help parents intentionally cultivate secure attachment, in their relationships with their kids. Of course, the first S, which isn't part of our four S's, is the sense-making one, which is really about getting clear on our own story or continuing to have meaning-making around our own stories and our own history. So I know we've talked about that a lot on the podcast previously, Mm -hmm. but that's the first piece of it. But in terms of what parents can begin doing right now, you know, I talk about that's an ongoing journey, like you just said, and that's not just a box you check off. But these other four S's, the first one is safety. And Sometimes parents are like, what do you mean? Why are you even talking about that? Of course, we keep our kids safe. And safety is really about, yes, protecting our children from harm. But there's another piece of this that comes out of the attachment literature, which is that we do not want to be the source of fear, terror, for our children. So, you know, obviously in in really severe ways, we can see that with abuse and neglect that parents really can do harm in being the source of pain and threat and fear for their children. But we do this in micro ways as well, where we undermine the safety of our children. And ways we can do that are by being unpredictable ourselves. You know, if there are substance use issues or We're really patient most of the time, but then we flip our lids and we yell at our children. We might scream and yell at our significant other, or maybe we come unglued with customer service people on the phone or things like that, (laughs) where we become frightening people, unpredictable, scary people. And, you know, a couple of things about that is, you know, first, do no harm. We want to really make sure we are protecting our children from things that can be damaging to them. But the second is, that idea that Dan already talked about, which is a rupture. So when you have those ruptures, we always want to repair. And that can look like, man, I handled that so poorly. I got really angry. I didn't regulate myself very well. I wish I had handled it differently. I'm so sorry. And and to make that repair. One other thing I just want to say, and then I'm sure Dan will have something wonderful to add, is that right now when we're talking about safety in a really unsafe time, when we don't feel safe ourselves because our neuroception is constantly being pulled for danger and threat, is all of us as mental health people have significant and I think valid concerns about the mental health implications of this time. And there is something we can do that is so simple that I think is so powerful, and that is this, to be thinking about our messaging. So with our kids, when we say things like, we're not going to the playground or you can't go to school or, you know, you can't see your friends because it's not safe. It's dangerous to do that. People can get sick. And we use threat-based, danger-based messaging. And we do that repeatedly. We know that the brain is making these neural associations. And my fear is that we are creating neuroception of danger around things like going to school, being with friends. So what we want to do with this idea of creating safety and our children relying on us as being safe harbors and safe havens from the storm is to focus all of our messaging from a safety based place. So what that sounds like instead is we're taking a break from school, we're taking a break from friends, we're taking a break from playgrounds because that keeps us safer. That's just a small little change in our language. But what happens is then our kids get these repeated messages of instead of the world is a dangerous, scary place, the message they get is my parent keeps me safe. And so then when the parent says it's time to go to the playground or we can have a friend over or it's time to go back to school, the child has an internalized working model of my parent keeps me safe, so this must be okay. And I think that one simple thing around safety messaging will really mitigate some of that fear and anxiety for our kids. But it's also a great practice for ourselves to be thinking about the messaging that we're giving ourselves about what's happening. I'm also thinking about kids peeking out and seeing their parents in masks, seeing other people in masks, and, you know, coherent narrative. Like, if we work on narrating this for them, telling the story that makes sense to them now, right now, while it's happening, in terms of safety, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and when we're helping our kids get used to masks, 
um, if we use a lot of play and silliness and joy connected to it, yeah. then it's a totally different sensory experience. And by the way, I've just purchased face masks that are clear so that you can see the nose and mouth because that's another thing to keep in mind is a lot of our neuroception for danger and safety is based on nonverbal information. So when our mouths and nose are covered up, we have the eyes which are powerful in terms of what they communicate. But for kids in particular, there's a lot of neuroception of safety being missed. You know, I've loved seeing the doctors who have a picture of their smiling face pinned mm -hmm. to their scrubs so that even though they're covered, the child can see a smiling face to get that neuroception of help and safety. So for all the therapists who are part of my team at the Center for Connection, I don't know how breathable they are, so they may not be very practical, but I've purchased a bunch of clear masks just so we can try to amplify a neuroception of safety for kids to see our, more of our face. Yeah, and hopefully, just from a practical point of view, there'll be a research study to compare those masks with actual face shields. So a face shield is, you know, you put it over your forehead, and then it has a big plastic thing going down that then covers your eyes, but it's completely visual. You can see the person's entire face. But in any event, it's a face shield. So what you can do with that then is if they can show that your likelihood of transmitting the virus with a face shield is just as low as with a face mask, that might be, well, it's something you can't produce at home, but it might be great because then you could see people's faces. That'd be really good. They're also totally washable. I mean, this is a hard time because the safety piece that is our first S, you know, is you know, the first deep evolutionarily significant meaning of attachment. Because what Tina and I do in The Power of Showing Up is basically we're summarizing attachment science to talk about how would you parent in a showing up way based on the science of attachment. Even though some approaches to parenting use the word attachment, they actually don't base anything they say based on the science of attachment. So this is a translation of the science through the lens of interpersonal neurobiology for parents. And so the first one is safety. And as Tina's pointing out, the two layers of it, just to remind everybody, is keeping your child safe, but also not being the source of terror for your child and always making a repair if there's ever a rupture in either of those. There's a book I'm just finishing reviewing that Alan Schroff is will publish soon, who's the main investigator for the longest study ever done. And the kids who are now studied before they were born are now in their 40s. And so I'm literally just at the very last few words of the book. And it's a powerful inner exploration of Alan's experience as a young person with his own attachment experiences and then woven together with his movement through college and then graduate school and then becoming basically one of our leaders in the whole field of attachment science. And it's just a beautiful thing. But what he does also is review all the most current scientific findings. So I would just reaffirm what Tina and I wrote in showing up after reading this book, you know, that relationships that provide safety provide resilience. And as Ed Tronic in his book that he just published a couple of weeks ago called The Power of Discord. No, actually, that one's coming out next month, too power of discord, the ruptures are an invitation to repair disconnection, even when you may have been terrifying to your kid. And it's that repair process, Ed Tronic and his colleague in that book make an argument that that is how kids develop resilience, this capacity you're mentioning, Sue, to self-regulate. You know, you learn this from not just interactive connection, but interactive rupture in the connection that then gets repaired. I've heard you speak about this related to rupture and repair with just a slight shift, which was something like, cause rupture sounds like pretty violent or huge. Yeah. And I think you've called it what repair actually is, is reconnection. It's yeah. disconnection it's and the reconnection. Yeah. I think that's a better way. That's not what's actually used in the science, but I think that is better to disconnection reconnection. Yeah. Well, it's hopeful. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's hopeful and doesn't make the rupture like, Oh my God, I've, <laughs> No, that's a, an artery or something. Right. So disconnection and reconnection. So, you know, that's what Ed Tronic's work beautifully shows. And I'm bringing that up here because as we move to the next S, anyone listening who's a parent themselves or working with parents, 
you know, Tina and I really try to emphasize this with our own stories is that there is no such thing as perfect parenting and your aim is not perfection. Your aim is presence. Your aim is to show up and not to think you're some kind of, you know, superhero of doing everything exactly the way, you know, a book might tell you to do it, even if you wrote the book, you know? So this is why we're always nervous, you know, whenever we set a book into words on paper, because we want to make sure the reader knows that there is no such thing as perfection. Even if you have a book setting you on a certain direction, that's actually a better way to parent with a directionality that you're headed toward. If you can have compassion toward yourself, knowing that you're human and that it doesn't always go the way your direction that you've intended meant for it to go. Now, this book is our North Star that we can stumble and paddle towards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just yeah. like a, a sailboat that heads a little this way, a little that way, a little this way, <laughs> you do it that way. But as a colleague of mine once said, you know, if a sailor doesn't know the direction they're going, there is no favorable wind. You know, so you, you really want to have a sense of how to sail the ship of your parenting. Yeah, it's organizing principles. So right. we've got safety, and you were leading into what the next one was with chronic Second organizing. End. Scene. Scene. So scene is really about looking at the mind behind the behavior. It's really tuning into what your child's internal experience is. And so, you know, one of the things that happens is that we are so focused as a culture on kids' behavior that we focus on the behavior and we address the behavior and we miss what is happening underneath the behavior. I have a moment, I remember when my youngest JP was complaining, we had said we were going to go to the movies and he said, well, can I have popcorn? And my husband told him no. And he started to pout and be really sad about not getting the popcorn. So what happens in that moment is, you know, your fear as a parent that my child is spoiled. He thinks the world's going to revolve around his wishes. And it activates this fear in us that, you know, he should be more grateful about getting to go to the movies. And so we can respond in a moment like that and say, well, you should just be grateful. A lot of kids don't get to go to the movies. And, you know, if you're going to be sad about popcorn, maybe we shouldn't even go. And what we want to do in that moment is to say, okay, full stop on all the fear places my brain is taking me where eventually I have an image of my child living in a van down by the river amounting to nothing, you know, because they're spoiled about movie popcorn, you know, and to have a full stop on those fears and to say, what is my child's internal experience? And then I can say, oh, he's disappointed. And last time we went, I bought him popcorn and he got excited about that as being part of what was happening and he feels disappointed. And then in my mind, I can say, well, if I feel like he needs to cultivate gratitude and have better perspective and, and those kinds of things, those are skills we can work on and we can talk about that at dinner and we can create a gratitude practice and a perspective practice with our mindfulness. But in this moment, I'm going to be present to what my child's internal experience is. And I can say, you're feeling disappointed you were really hoping you were going to get popcorn. Is that right? And he nods and the tears then can be released. And then, of course, I don't have, that doesn't mean I have to do anything. I don't have to buy the popcorn, but I'm really just present to his internal experience. And I think this is so important because oftentimes when our children's internal world leads them to uncomfortable emotions like sadness, disappointment, frustration, embarrassment, anger, you know, as parents, if we don't know how to tolerate those emotions and we don't know how to tolerate our child's experience of those emotions, we're going to distract or criticize. But when I show up in the moment with my own fears and respond in a way that's critical, like you should be more grateful, then my child has an experience of when I share my thoughts and feelings with my parent, it doesn't feel good that doesn't work so well. So then they learn over time to not do that. So instead, I want my child in this scene to know that when they share themselves with me, including behavior that's really obnoxious at times, that's sometimes how they're communicating what's happening, that I can show up in that moment to really tune into what's happening to help them understand with words and with connection what that feels like, what it means, so that then they have an experience of firing and wiring of when I share my thoughts and feelings and my experiences with my parent, that feels good. That works well for me. And that just builds that connection even more deeply. 
you said a couple of things. One is you don't have to give the popcorn. <laughs> and the other word that came to my mind was accuracy. And what you're conveying by actually seeing their internal experience instead of our own, that they're a separate person that we are recognizing, that we're able to see them as separate, and that parents can get into a lot of trouble with that, with, like you were saying, like our own stuff, our own garbage <laughs> getting in the way. So Yeah, what we really want our kids to emerge from is that in moments over time, they feel felt. That's one of Dan's beautiful phrases. Mm -hmm. They feel understood. Their internal experience and how we respond are a match, so it creates a coherent core self. And to and that's over time in moments, but then also on a grander scale, we want them to parent gets to be no and on not not science or whatever to we want our kids to feel like who I am is known and celebrated my parents got me no Tina um that's so beautifully said so just to build on what Tina's saying so we can hear every word of your wonderful um approaches to this and thank know. you for showing up for me there Dan absolutely absolutely <laughs> you know um and this is the idea that sometimes a message may not be as clear as we intended to be or whatever, and then relying on each other. So the word seen is more than just, you know, what you do with your eyes, you know, it's this mind sight stuff. And as Tina is powerfully saying, you know, what's the mind, what's the subjective experience beneath the behavior that's driving the behavior. And, you know, if you just want a simple acronym of sifting the mind of sensations, images, feelings, thoughts to check out with your kid, you know, what are the sensations in their body the auditory visual images they might have, the feelings, you know, the emotions that are going on in their thoughts. So at a minimum, you want to help your child to sift their own experience for their own being seen by themselves, but for you to check into those things. And it's amazing. I'm working now with a family where it was just not in the family culture to be seen. So I think it's important just to say that you can have a mind, that is, you could have emotions and memories and thoughts and beliefs and attitudes and intentions and desires and longings, all that stuff we put on the word mind. And you can also have not developed the capacity to be aware that those are mental activities. So you have the feeling, but you don't have another aspect of your mind that goes, oh, I'm Sue and I have this feeling. I'm Teen and I have this thought. I'm Dan and I have this memory. And so a, I get lost in my memory, for example, rather than having what's called a meta memory process of, you know, being able to reflect within awareness, there is a memory process that's a part of my mental apparatus. So we simply call that capacity mind sight to see the mind or, you know, theory of mind, reflective function, mentalization, mind, mind, and the psychological mind. There's a lot of terms over the last 30 years in the science of all this that have come up. And mindsight is just a simple way of saying, do you have this capacity to be aware of your own mind or the mind of another? And to honor the differences and promote linkages between the two, which is integration. So being seen requires a mindsight ability on your part of, as a parent. So part of what the second S does, it says to the parent reading the book, for example, or just studying the science of attachment, that your capacity to have mindsight to be able to, you know, Peter Fonda's terms, mentalize or reflect on the mental nature of things or to be mind-minded, you know, or even Mary Ainsworth said a long time ago that what she means by sensitive parenting, the basis of secure attachment, was does the parent's mind have the mind of the child inside of her or his mind? So this is really a very central aspect to attachment science that the parent doesn't just respond to behavior, that they are making sense of the inner life, the subjective experience, the inner mental experience of the child. Now, amazingly, through a lot of different studies, you can make this simple statement, that relational experience of your parent seeing that you have a mind beneath your behavior develops your mind sight abilities. And this is where you can see as this family I'm working with, the family in the generation before also didn't have mind sight. And so of course this one doesn't. And then the next one wouldn't if they weren't in therapy with me. And so we're doing this intervention, which is 
you would think it's like magic, but I'm teaching them not just to have feelings and thoughts, but to have the mind sight ability to sit with an awareness and work with those thoughts, have a different relationship to their own mental life. And that changes everything. So the second S after safety, we have now seen is that even if you're a parent who doesn't know how to do this because you didn't get it as a kid, no problem. We're going to teach you how to do it in the book. Yeah, that's one of the best parts about this science is that it is full of hope. <laughs> it's yeah. full of hope that says it's never too late. These working models are based on experiences. So once you create new experiences, you're changing the working models that really, as we practice this and give our minds and our brains the reps, just like when we lift weights and we get stronger, we're giving them the reps, yeah, to tune in and attune to our child's inner experience. Then we, we start learning how to do that for ourselves. And that's so beautiful. You just see transformation there. It's like developing a secure attachment with yourself so that you're noticing you're, you're with exactly. yourself, you're compassionate. Yeah. Exactly. And that, that brings us to the third S in many ways. And the terms are hard here. And, you know, it's so fun working with Tina because we can just get right to how we can translate this for parents. With the interns, when I was re- doing the developing mind, they'd always see me kind of get all restless, you know, 18 of them in the institute. And there I am with them at the end of the table and we're all talking and stuff. And but I'd all get restless because in the science, they use the term self-regulation. And it would drive me nuts because I think that's a problem with our planet is that we think the self is inside your head. So I would always cringe and I would go, I'll call, let's just call it for now anyway. It's a clunky term, but let's call it inner regulation. So that the child learns inner regulation through interactive regulation. Notice I didn't use the word self there at all because the relationship is the self as much as the inner life is the self. So to get to what you're saying, Sue, is that these interactive experiences of being safe and when it's disconnected, a reconnection is established, being seen and when it's disconnected, a reconnection is established, allow a child to be soothed, the third S. And in those interactive, soothing, regulatory transactions that allow you to go from distress to feeling calm, that's what interactive regulation is, you actually build the circuitry in your own brain, in the body you were born into, I'm so avoiding the word self there, right? (laughs) An inner capacity to regulate states of intensity that can be experienced as discomfort that we call dysregulation and tending toward chaos or rigidity and moving yourself back toward an integrative flow that's a more sense of harmony. We talk about things like the window of tolerance, you know, where you can learn to tolerate, let's say, a feeling of anger or fear or sadness and stay integrated with feeling a very rich amount of anger, sadness, or fear in terms of uncomfortable things, or for some kids, even joy or elation or excitement or surprise. I know some people have adopted the window of tolerance term and think of it as some space between hyperarousal and hypoarousal. But when I made up that phrase, window of tolerance, it was not to be hyper or hypoarousal. It was about an integrative flow that was flowing between chaos and rigidity because you can be extremely hyper aroused. Let's say I'm really excited to be with Tina because she's written a new book, which is a fabulous book, the bottom line for baby. And I'm really excited about it. I am so hyper aroused, which I am actually, it's a great book and everyone should buy it. You know, so now I'm really hyper aroused. I'm giving Tina a virtual hug. I'm giving Scott high fives for the family's accomplishment and the boys I'm really excited about. And I'm totally integrated and I'm in harmony and I'm super hyper aroused and I'm staying integrated. I'm not chaotic. I'm not rigid. So this is where I get nervous when people have adopted the window of tolerance phrase for, oh, Dan is too hyper aroused. And I go, no, I I stayed integrated. So don't use the word hyper, even though I'm super energized. And the same thing would be the hypo thing. I could get super low key meditative unbelievably low arousal in my hammock, right? And the the hummingbirds are floating by. And I am so chill and I'm so integrated. I'm not rigid, I'm not chaotic, but I'm hypo, I'm really low arousal. 
and I'm like going just in this incredible state, but I'm integrative. Whereas in other settings, you know, if I'm like about to go give a talk to a bunch of people and I'm that unenergized, that would not be so good. And I would become rigid, you know, or if I got too energized, I could become chaotic. So sometimes it goes where hyperarousal is chaotic and hypoarousal is rigid. Sometimes it is that way. I think that's why people generalized it. And instead of staying with the complexity theory view, which is, comes from math, that's where the, that all comes from, that there's this harmonious thing when you differentiate and link, no matter the degrees of arousal, you can stay combining differentiation and linkage. And this is why expanding the window of tolerance is really an integration issue. It's a challenge of integration so that if in my family, no one was ever too happy, if I got super excited about Tina's wonderful new book, I might be incredibly chaotic because I never learned to widen my window for states of joy like that. I say that because soothe really invites us as parents to check into our own window of tolerance for whatever the particular distress is of our child so that we come and show up in a window of tolerance, right? So that we are in an integrated state, no matter what the level of arousal. This is the point I, of that little, what looked like a digression. It's just to really get to the science of what Tina and I try to explain in the book. So that you're staying in this receptive state of integration, not degrees of arousal, high or low. It could be, but not necessarily at all. And now you come with this integrative state and you say, what's going on? And your child says, I'm so angry about not know how to popcorn with a movie. And as Tina beautifully said in that example with JP, you know, it's like, oh, wow, tell me more. It looks like you really wanted popcorn. Now, if I couldn't handle anger and my window is really narrow, I might be going, what are you spoiled little brat? You think you're supposed to be having popcorn for every time you go to the movie? Oh, let's not go to this movie. And you probably see a lot of parents do that because yeah. they busted through their window and they got chaotic instead of showing up and staying present within their own window of tolerance. So JP can get soothed in his distress that he didn't get the popcorn. You can stay at the movies. There's communication and learning because as we teach in No Drama Discipline, parenting and discipline is about teaching skills, not about punishing. So you teach the skill of inner regulation JP can go from saying, I really, really want a popcorn, says this guy, why aren't I having popcorn, whatever. And the two of them are amazing people, Tina and Scott, I'll just say <laughs> it straight up. So they can stay in this really broad window of tolerance. They stay integrated no matter what the level of arousal, no matter what the topic, well, maybe there's certain emotions that are more narrow than others. For me, that for sure that's true. And then they stay present that way, or you tag team about who's present, who's not. Because right. you can tell when your window narrows, I can't be present for you right now in your distress, so I can't soothe you. So soothing is where you come in this integrative place of the river of integration. You tune into the state of suffering of another. You receive them, and the two separate entities now become part of one whole, the whole W-H-O-L-E, because the window of taunts was wide enough that the parent in this case, talking about parenting, could be receptive to the suffering. And in our view, suffering comes from decreased states of integration. You have to have this wide window of integrative receptivity to then reach into JP's distress about the popcorn. His lowered state is putting him in chaos and rigidity. No matter what his arousal is, he could be pouting in a low state of arousal or screaming in a high state of arousal. Either way, he's not integrative. That's the point. And so now you are reaching toward chaos or rigidity, which is all examples of suffering fit into that. And then you stay present enough where you bring him into the relationship of a we, and he goes from this non-integrated, which equals distress state, and because of the interaction, the interactive connection, allows him to become more integrated. He can stay with his frustration about the popcorn, feel the longing for popcorn. I keep on saying popcorn. I want to eat popcorn now. <laughs> Me too. I'm starving. Eat. My mirror neurons are... <laughs> yeah, I've got to do inner regulation now about the popcorn. And the issue of the self here is that his self, JP's self, is a wee with his dad and mom in the movies. 
So he's got inner regulation, which of course is a skill you want to encourage that comes from the interactive regulation. And we never use the word self and we're fine. <laughs> well, And that's what's so hard about soothing is oftentimes because of our connectivity and being held captive to each other's nervous systems, it's so easy to join our child's states of disintegration and to join the chaos and the rigidity instead of really staying in that integrated state. And so it it really requires intention and practice and it does get easier over time. But really what that soothing is about, it's about nurturing, it's about comforting, it's about helping right in that moment. And so I can say you're so disappointed, you really wanted the popcorn and you're feeling really sad about that. And that's okay to feel sad about not getting that. It, It doesn't feel good to feel disappointed at times. And I'm right here with you while you feel disappointed. Again, not, it's not permissive. I don't have to buy the popcorn. But I want to say that what that looks like, that comfort and soothing part, sometimes is just meeting physical needs. You know, it might be wrapping a towel around our child when they're getting out of the bathtub and they're upset about something. And we say, oh, I've got a warm towel for you. Come here. As they get older, it might be to say, you seem so upset, I'm right here with you. And we can just say, I'm right here with you, or I will listen, or I'm here if you need me, if we have teenagers who don't necessarily want to connect in those (laughs) moments. And I think that what Dan was saying is exactly right, that when we co-regulate like that, it actually gives their brain one more rep of going from a disintegrated state back into an integrated state so that there becomes more automaticity for how to do that on their own when they have dysregulating states. And I think this piece of really showing up for them in that moment is so powerful. And, and, you know, right now in this time, we are expecting things from our children and from ourselves that are actually impossible. Sometimes the expectations we have are just impossible right now. And so when we think about the expectations being way higher than our capacity in a moment, that gap there can create a lot of dysregulation, a lot of disintegration. And so, you know, typically we think about how do I decrease the expectations while building capacity and really showing up for each other is a really great way to increase capacity. I think one other thing I want to say about sort of the safe scene and soothed all together before we get to that fourth S of secure is that once as a parent, we realize that when our children are in distress, whether that looks like disintegrated mood, whether it looks like disintegrated behavior, they may be screaming and yelling and flailing and taking it out on you, or they may be pouting and won't talk to you or slamming doors or whatever it looks like. Once we realize that when our children are falling apart, that we actually don't have to fix anything or change anything, but all we need to do is to show up with presence in that moment and meet them where they are and connect with them, it's incredibly liberating. So when JP, you know, is crying because he's disappointed, I can say it's so disappointing, it feels hard to feel that, I'm right here with you, and I don't have to do anything except just be present, it takes so much pressure off. And you all know that there's a lot of part of our parenting culture now where parents feel like they have to fix everything and and they they feel like they have to prevent their children from suffering in any way. And it's such a disservice because it doesn't give them those experiences of sitting in the discomfort of uncomfortable feelings with enough support that they strengthen and widen that window of tolerance. But it's incredibly liberating to say all I have to do, even when I don't have the answers, even when I don't know what to do as a parent or as a therapist or as a spouse, even if I don't know what to do or the right thing to say or how to fix this, I know I can always just be present to join them in that moment. And that's so freeing. It's liberating. I think about couples therapy. You know, this is so relevant to couples therapy as far as deactivating that fix urge. I really appreciate, Dan, you specifying what you meant about window of tolerance. And I agree that I think that there's a lot of confusion. But would you mind saying just a little bit about the crossover between Porges work and polyvagal theory? Because that's when I often see it used versus the way that you're saying it. Like it feels like there's an overlap, but it's not the same thing. Is that right? Sure. Well, you know, Pat Ogden in sensory motor psychotherapy uses this concept of window of tolerance there from a clinical point of view. Now, Steve Porges is not a clinician, but he's written two clinically oriented books for our series, our interpersonal neurobiology series. And so he will talk about 
in the polyvagal theory, you know, you have the dorsal branch of the vagus nerve, which is the older, unmyelinated branch of the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. And then he has the myelinated newer branch, the ventral branch of the vagus nerve. And that you have these two branches performing very different functions and their way of connecting with the sympathetic nervous system, which is a very activating one, is more complicated than just what we usually say, which is that the autonomic nervous system, which streams from the head brain down into the body, you know, has two branches, just the parasympathetic and the sympathetic branch was like a brake and accelerator, too much arousal of the brakes and not enough arousal of the accelerator, and then you're hypo aroused, too much of the accelerator, not enough of the brakes, and you're hyper aroused. That's the classic way. So it gets a little more complicated because when you activate the dorsal branch of the vagus nerve in a big way without any sympathetic counteraction, then you drop your blood pressure, you drop your heart rate, and you faint and you literally collapse at the face of feeling of helplessness. And that's very different from the ventral branch of the vagus nerve, which is also parasympathetic, like the dorsal branch. But there, what you're getting is the peaceful calm of the receptive open state. So when Steve and Pat and I were talking, when I was writing the Pocket Guide to Interpersonal Neurobiology, you know, we said, we've got to clarify for clinicians that it isn't just fight or flight or freeze, that people were confusing the dorsal activation of faint with the sympathetic activation of freeze because freeze is a very energy consuming. So it's a sympathetic branch, adrenaline based. I'm tightening up my muscles. I'm temporarily um, not going to act. I'm not going to function. So in that sense, it's super aroused, but there's not much motion. So are you going to call that behavioral inhibition? Well, yes. Is it hyper arousal? Well, yes. So, which is it? Hyper, hypo arousal? That's why it doesn't really apply so much. And then you say, well, but it's parasympathetic arousal. Well, then you've got to, with Porges' view, you've got to say, which branch are you really talking about? This is where Steve's work is so beautiful and the polyvagal theory. And when you combine the books in the series that Steve wrote with one with a colleague, with the ones that Jacques Panksepp wrote on the subcortical influence of neural firing on emotional states. They're just two beautiful, beautiful books that Yacht, before he passed away, wrote. You get this really great dive from these two non-clinicians of very clinically useful complexities, for sure, uh, so that you stop saying the amygdala is the emotion center of the brain. You, won't, you don't talk like that anymore because you realize it's all these subcortical circuits, including the heart and the intestine, everything below the cortex. And then you see, you know, in, with other people's writings, that the experience of emotion is also shaped by experience. So you have these subcortical inputs, including the polyvagal inputs, but then you have what Lisa Feldman Barrett, or it may be Barrett Feldman, I always flip them around. But anyway, what she powerfully wrote about was the social construction of emotion. But even if you look at the fine print of her book called How Emotions Are Made, you see that she says, oh, and by the way, in this book, I'm not going to deal with subcortical circuits. And you go, what? But her work is really important because it says the cortex is going to learn based on culture and based on attachment experiences how to shape meaning so that we don't want to talk about universal emotions. That's her take, which is a really powerful, important thing. But then Steve Porges' work and Jacques Panksepp's work says there is a universality to these subcortical ways that activations influence emotional experience. So all that being said, when I've read all of Feldman Barrett's work and all of Yock's work and all of Steve's work, to me still the integration framework holds and that what you're really looking towards is the system subcortical and cortical allowing differentiation and linkage so that Which is the, social emotional yeah. would we would we be able to say that this you know with, with Porges stuff is that in, inside the window would that also relate to the social engagement system yeah so that's why it's much more intricate than just saying hypo arousal or hyper arousal because yeah. when the ventral vagal system is activated Steve would say your neuroception, as Tina talked about earlier, is evaluating safety and then turns on the social engagement system. 
The simplest way to say it, and we say it in our book this following way. We have a whole book devoted to this, by the way, called The Yes Brain. The brain can be either in a reactive state or a receptive state. The reactive state can be fight, flight, freeze, or faint. The receptive state would be the ventral vagal nerve being activated that makes the brain calm down and become receptive. So what we're saying in the safety, in the scene, and the soothe, so that you have the fourth S of security, is that you, in your interactive way of showing up and being present, have taught your child the capacity for inner regulation to move themselves from these no-brain reactive states of fighting, fleeing, freezing, fainting, which are both hyper-aroused and hypo-aroused, but they're all non-integrative. That's where the whole thing starts to make sense when you stop focusing on levels of arousal, which I find very not helpful, but rather look to the state of integration. And then you see a state of integration is created with super arousal of the ventral vagal nerve, so you could say, well, that's too aroused. No, no, that's integrative. It allows all the different systems of the nervous system and the body as a whole and the relational world to become hugely differentiated and linked, which is the definition of integration. So this is where, you know, in reviewing all that stuff, because it can drive you wild, there's so much detail, but it comes down to this. Security of attachment comes from integrative communication with your parent that was reconnected when disconnection happened, that teaches you the integration at the heart of resilience so that literally your brain will have a more integrated set of anatomic connections. And that if you didn't have that, take the extreme example of you know, disorganized attachment in the form of abuse or neglect. Look at the work of Martin Teicher out of Harvard University at McLean Hospital. The major finding with those examples of impaired security of attachment, in other words, abuse and neglect is the most extreme you get away from security in terms of forms of attachment, the main brain finding is impaired integration in the brain. So you can say integrative relationships where a parent shows up, that's what we call it, the showing the power of showing up. When you show up, you can be present for your child so you're differentiated and linked. And so JP says, I want the popcorn, I want the popcorn. You don't ignore him and say, get away, kid, you bother me. No, you're present for him, but you're differentiated. You're not flipping out and going, I want popcorn too. No, you're not. Like that. You're differentiating and you're linked. So it's a relational integration. And over time, and you should see these three incredible boys. I was going to say, JP is going to kill you later. No, they, I have permission to tell that story. I have permission to tell that story. <laughs> okay. They are so integrated, those boys. But the non-integrated thing was, if you ever read our book where we talk about JP on the cupcakes. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, so the point is that the concept of integration is that relational integration leads to neural integration. And it turns out that neural integration is the basis for all forms of regulation. Regulating attention, emotion, mood narrative, making sense process, thought, behavior, morality, relationality, all of those regulatory things, if you look at the brain correlates, they require integration in the brain. And I told the interns, please, this is too simple to be true. You got to show me one study that goes against this. They couldn't find even one study. Integrative relationships lead to integration in the brain. And if you look at the Smith et al. study in 2015, they looked at every measure of well-being they could find. And there was one brain correlate to every measure of well-being. It was how integrated your brain was. Just look at that paper. It's how interconnected your connectome is. So my interns, when they were reviewing that paper, they were like blown away because this whole framework is that every study ever done on any psychiatric disorder of the brains of those individuals shows impaired integration in the brain. Every symptom of every syndrome described in the DSM has impaired integration in the brain. What are the major inputs of things like mindfulness training? The brain becomes more integrated. And the Smith et al. study then shows well-being of every measure you could find is predicted by integration of the brain. They were all jumping up and down with excitement because basically for the third edition, we could say 
you know, the hypothesis from the 90s in the first edition now has literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies that support the statement, integrative relationships lead to an integrated brain leads to a healthy, happy person. And security, that's what security is. And that's really the mechanism behind the findings, these longitudinal findings that say that one of the best predictors for how well kids turn out is that they have secure attachment with, you know, at least one person, if not more and better more, that that is the mechanism that secure attachment relationships promote integration in the brain. That's the main conclusion of that. And so just to kind of pull everything together there, not perfect, but enough repeated experiences where kids feel safe, seen, and soothed lead to that fourth S of secure, which is not a self-esteem thing, like I feel secure about myself, although that is an outcome, but it's actually that the brain has wired to securely know and predict that if they have a need, someone will show up for them. And the next piece of that is that because that has been wired as an internal working model and as integration in the brain in a more structural way, what we're seeing is that they expect other relationships to be that way. You know, you talk about Srov's findings of, of kids with secure attachment having healthier romantic relationships in their teen and young adult years. And so they have healthier relationships. They expect people to show up for them. And the final piece of what this leads to is the most rewarding for me in terms of when I think about my job as raising people who go out to be adults in the world and become parents themselves and this multi-generational legacy that we are all building from our relational experiences is that they learn how to keep themselves safe. They learn how to see and understand themselves. They learn how to soothe their states of dysregulation. Did you see how I avoided that other S word there? <laughs> Including even saying, I need, I need to connect with somebody to help me regulate right now, right? That's part of, of self-regulation. I used air quotes for those of you who were just listening, is connecting. So all of that means that they learn the power of showing up for themselves and for other people. And I think one other thing I think that has to be said, and that is that particularly when we are in times of distress, which we are now, that this is in some ways it's simple to say, look, this is the North Star. If you find yourself as a parent, as a clinician, as a significant other, as a best friend, not knowing what to say or do, this is the North Star. What you always can do, which is always the right thing, is to help the other person feel safe, seen, and soothed. That's it. But that's not always easy. It may be a simple idea. It's not always easy. And so in order to make sure we have the capacity to do that in all of our relationships, we need to remember that we matter too. I'm saying to all of you, you matter too. So making sure you're showing up for yourself. And what we talked about earlier is kind of curiously attending to your own sense of feeling safe, seen, and soothed, and making sure you have people who show up for you too, doing that for yourself, and then having other people who can do that for us as well. That is beautiful. I was imagining in a mic drop. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> here's the answer. <laughs> and it's true. Like what you're saying with dancing is it's like, this is not somebody's good idea this is all based in hard science, and it has been reviewed and reviewed. And I think that you guys have done such a beautiful job of pulling out the essence of it and helping us know what to do. Oxygen mask on us first. <laughs> so first of all, I want to direct everybody to the show notes. There you'll find a link to the book and all of these books that have been mentioned. We've mentioned a couple of people that have been, we have previous episodes interviewing. Sroof is one of them, if you can believe it. We don't get a lot of attachment researchers. So he's on there and Steve Forges and Deb Dana and folks who will talk more about the polyvagal are in other episodes and we'll link to those. But should they look for you, the two of you directly, how will they find you? My website is tinabryson.com and that's B-R-Y-S-O-N. And mine is Dr. Dan Siegel, D-R-D-A-N-S-I-E-G-E-L.com or at Mindsight, M-I-N-D-S-I-G-H-T, MindsightInstitute.com. They're interconnecting websites, but those two sites. We both have links to all of our social media okay. from our websites. And I should Perfect. probably mention too, I mentioned my clinical practice, the center for connection.org is one of the only places, maybe the only place that I'm aware of that is an interdisciplinary interpersonal neurobiology based practice where all the fundamental principles of interpersonal neurobiology, including that each clinician is differentiated and we are functionally linked and we are always reflecting on 
if we see chaos and rigidity in our organization, it's our business model. If we see chaos and rigidity in our business model, what does that mean? Does that mean there's too much differentiation? Does that mean there's not enough linkage? So this is actually our business model, and we practice this with all of the families that come and see us. So you can learn more about that at thecenterforconnection.org. And what was the name of your book that Dan mentioned? Oh, Dan, you're so sweet. Thank you. Dan's reviewing it right now. And it's called The Bottom Line for Baby. And it is my first solo book. And I have to say, as proud as I am of this book, it was it's way more fun to write books with Dan than to write them on my own. I hope I'm looking forward to writing more with you, Dan. But I'm really proud of the book because it's the book I wanted and needed as a new parent. It's the idea of taking about 60 topics that we get a lot of competing information on as new parents, where it's very confusing. You have people telling you all kinds of different things and even what you read about is conflicting. So it kind of lays out, it's alphabetical. So you can flip to say sleep training. It lays out the main arguments for and against. And then there's a section that says what the science says. And I've reviewed really just the strong current meta analyses or say that there aren't any. And then I give a bottom line for what the science guides us to or some things to think about as we're making decisions based on our values as parents. And I'll tell you the bottom line of the bottom line is that we can't do everything perfectly. And what our kids need most is for us to really be present and trust our instincts, be science informed, but really show up and, and trust our instincts. So that's sort of the bottom line of the bottom so line. It, it, overlaps, it overlaps directly right yeah, into. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, Dan was my teacher and my friend and my colleague now. And so there's like an entire region of my brain that is the Dan Siegel region of my brain. And so everything I think is filtered through and I hear your words, Dan, and I hear your voice and, and you are definitely part of my mind and heart and all of my work. Oh, I feel the same about you, Tina. So thank you. It's an honor. And thank you, Sue, for letting us have time to hang out together with you. And what do they say in Texas to, to visit? <laughs> That's right. To visit. I think there's something else, but I don't know. We're having a hoedown. I don't know. <laughs> you guys have been so generous with your time. Really, really appreciate it. Our audience is going to love, love, love this. And uh, I'll certainly send it to you when we have it published and would really love it if you guys would share it on Absolutely. your networks as well. And Sue, thank you for being such a force in this interpersonal neurobiology field and connecting people and helping us really get lots of ways of thinking about living and working from this lens. And I'm so appreciative of you. And you are part of this IPNB revolution. And I'm so glad to know you. And and I'm proud of the work you've done. That is so sweet. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That's definitely our what we want to do is really bring this further and further out to people who would not otherwise know who the two of you were or even want to be interested in a book like this. That's our job. So thank you. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. So I, I, I share Tina's gratitude toward you and together, you know, we can really bring these ideas out in the world. So thank you so much. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson. 